Hi, this is David Thornburg, President and CEO of the Committee of 70, uh, Philadelphia's longstanding voice for better government and a stronger local democracy. Uh, you are watching another installment of Studio C70, which is our communications platform where we get to talk with people from around the country who are engaged in the kind of work that, uh, that we pursue, again, trying to strengthen and improve democracy at, at all levels. Today, we're very fortunate to uh, have a, a special guest uh, that I want to bring in, uh, Catherine Gale. Uh, Catherine, welcome. Uh, David, thank you. So happy Catherine, to be here. Catherine is, is co-author of a book that is about to be released that I highly recommend and we're going to talk about today, which is called The Politics Industry, How Political Innovation Can Break Partisan Gridlock and Save Our Democracy. It sounds like you are, to my view, you are hitting the right note at the right time, Catherine. So congratulations on, on writing the book. Your first, I think, isn't it? It is my first. And I will tell you that pretty much any time over the last year, I would have also said it was going to be my last. <laughs> it is a process. It's a yeah. whole different career. Um, yeah. But, it, you know, it's it's been really wonderful to focus on getting the ideas down. And then, you know, I'm so committed to action on this issue of how can we make our democracy function better, well, that I'm just thrilled that it's finally coming out. That's great. I should should note you have a significant co-author in Michael Porter, uh, call him a guru of uh, business and competitive strategy at the Harvard Business School. And uh, we'll we'll learn along the way how uh, you uh, and Michael came together to collaborate, but but let's start with with your own story. Um, I, I read a little bit about you, and I, you and I have met a couple times before. It doesn't seem to me like you were born and raised to, to be a political innovator or political reformer. You have a a less traditional route to this pursuit than some. Yes, I really have been in business and for most of my career. I was actually running, most recently, a food manufacturing company in Wisconsin. It's a quarter of a billion dollar company. And food manufacturing, we did make cheese, I have to say that. Uh, <laughs> because which makes us everyone truly, in Wisconsin makes cheese, I think, right? Yeah, truly Wisconsin company. And I sold that company in 2015, in part to dedicate full time to this issue of the functioning of our republic. And as a, you know, sort of how these worlds came together is I'm running my business, but at the same time, I care deeply about the policies of the country and how we're doing. And I have kids too. And, you know, so many of us say, well, we want the world to be a better place for our kids and for everyone else's kids. And I was the same. I was, I got involved in politics by working with candidates and, you know, that seemed like the right thing to do if you care about government, work with candidates. And then I was disappointed by what ended up happening in Washington, DC. It didn't seem that we would get different results fundamentally that based on who was elected. We would talk about different issues. We would, you know, the fight would look different, but we couldn't solve the difficult complex issues like immigration or uh, the debt deficit, et cetera. And so I finally came to understand that we don't have a politician problem or even a policy problem. We really have a political system problem. Yeah. And once I knew that, I've never looked back. Yeah, I, I heard you speak uh, a couple of years ago when you talked about working through the, the stages, I think you call it the stages of political grief or something like that, looking for some way to make a difference. And you said at the outset, you figured I'll just support candidates, but what were the other stages that you worked through? Oh yeah, thank you. Yes, you're right. So I said, oh, things aren't going right. I know, I'll work on candidates. And I got deeply involved in presidential campaign in 2008 and I loved that. And then I said, oh, hmm. That didn't give me the transformation I wanted. I know I'll work on policy. And so I joined the CEO Fiscal Leadership Council of Fix the Debt, you know, because we couldn't get bipartisan agreement. We had government shut down and 
and debt ceiling impasse, et cetera. And then I said, oh, guess what? Behind closed doors, everyone knows what the policy is that we need. They agree behind closed doors, just that no one has the political will to you know, do this. So I said, I know, I'll work on culture. And so then I got deeply involved with a wonderful new organization called No Labels, which was saw these same problems and was calling for a new era of bipartisanship. And people would, it, our legislators in Congress would sign on. I mean, we're getting bipartisan people to wear the pin and to you know participate in meetings. But in the end, they said they wanted to work together and they still voted exactly the same way. So I said, ah. Oh, Okay, so that didn't work. I know, I'll go back to candidates, but I have a better idea. I'll work on independent candidates, which I said was not beholden to either side of the duopoly. And well, that didn't work because they couldn't get elected. And then finally, Mickey Edwards, who was former Republican congressman, wrote an amazing book called Parties Versus the People, where he made this case that it's the system. Washington isn't broken. It's working exactly how it's designed to work. And again, I, I've never been able to unsee that. So I realized it was a system that was the last stage, it's the stage I'm still in, but I wouldn't call it grief anymore because now that I'm in that stage, I don't think there's gonna be another one. I don't think this stage will disappoint me. This is the root cause. And we have solutions that we can actually achieve. It's extraordinary. I can't believe I got to root cause and it actually turns out to be almost easier than some of the things that weren't root cause. Yeah, you've gotten back to, to for, first principles, as it were. Um, I, exactly. I was saying to you earlier, this book is, I think, refreshing in that it's a book that is clearly about politics, but not written by political scientists. Uh, and the combination of you as a, as a business owner uh, and Michael Porter as a business uh, researcher and thinker and strategist is is refreshing and uh, and really, I hope, and I'm sure you hope, gets people thinking about this in a very different way. So tell the story of how you and Michael Porter came together and then how you started, You, as far as I'm concerned, you coined the term the politics industry. So, which kind of sets the stage for uh, the challenges we have in front of us, but how did all that come about? Yeah, so uh, while I was going through stages of political grief, I was running my company and I was, of course, trying to change things. And then I did a strategy project, the classic business strategy for my food manufacturing company, and I used the five forces. And while I was working on that strategy, which was compelling for my company and turned out great. In this other side of my head, I was having epiphany after epiphany after epiphany. Oh, barriers to entry, politics system, you know, um, customers, suppliers, substitutes, everything was, was happening in this analysis as I was doing my company analysis. And I just found it so illuminating that it was the same. Yeah. And it, but at that time, I actually just took it, you know, into my own head in a sense. And then I would explain it to some people along the way. And I said, politics is an industry. So that's when I coined the politics industry. And that's when politics industry theory, which is this application of competition thinking of politics was born, et cetera. But I, um, I didn't do anything with it at that time. In fact, I went into a transaction with my company. And then after the transaction, I was trying to get business people engaged in this political reform work and nobody wanted to really be engaged. They, and I realized that what was missing was the business case for investment. We needed to show the ROI. We need to show business people that if you invest in changing the system, it will work and it's worth your time because in business, you know, we don't control everything, but we generally, know how to do that. And so I would see business people like, oh my God, that is such a mess over there. I, I wish it were different, but I cannot afford to invest my time or resources or network into that. And so I said, I'm gonna write up this business case and I'll do it using 
the five forces and the tools of competition thinking, not because it's the only way to look at politics. There are lots of other ways and, and traditional ways in political sciences, but because it's uniquely illuminating to think of it in terms of competition and actually not just for business leaders, but also for consumers, because you know, people are used to buying things and having choice or not having choice. So you can make this analogy. And so I wanted to write it up and which I did, and I asked Michael Porter to join me as a co-author because his reach and buy-in and uh, sort of like the legitimacy that he brings to this, since it was a totally new way to use his framework, the five forces, was really so important to getting these ideas out. Sure. And, you know, over time, he actually uh, came to really be passionate about the, you know, the work as well. I think initially that was uh, a bit of a stretch for him, but then he really realized after a while, wow, this, this really is yeah. fascinating. He always tells me he's amazed that the five forces work for this. <laughs> well, yes. the, you alluded to this, but the, the core of this book says we need to fix politics in this country, not as an end unto itself, not because it's, you know, the American thing to do, but because it actually, the way we're doing politics right now is a drag on our global competitiveness. And there's a, a couple of charts in the book that said, you know, you look at the metrics of success, of, uh, of uh, social or economic success, and to call us the United States of America, fair to Midland, is sometimes a bit of a stretch. Um, but ex explain how that works, because it sounds, most people think these are two different realms. There's politics and there's business and ne'er the twain shall meet. Yeah, and this actually is another benefit of working with Michael Porter, because prior to my asking him to co-author on politics, he also had led with his colleague, Jan Rivkin at HBS, a multi-year study on US competitiveness. And what, and then he also led the development of what's now called the social progress index. So essentially looking at both halves of what it takes to have a thriving uh, quality of life for people, which includes, do they have good jobs? And it includes, you know, is, is this a good place to live? So, what we find is in US competitiveness, which we speak of as being two factors together, which is that businesses have to be able to compete successfully in the global economy, but you also have to, if you're truly competitive, have high and rising living standards for employees. You can't just have business success. That's not what it's about. That's not what capitalism should deliver. We have to deliver both halves. And it turns out that we used to be a leader in the factors that determine how competitive the US is, which is how likely we are to succeed for the businesses and employees at the same time. And we are relative to our competitors. So other countries that we compete against, we actually have areas of great weakness and that are declining. So, for example, our healthcare system, our education system, uh, the burden of some of our legal environments and regulatory. And we, it's interesting when you look at this, and I invite people to check out the book because we show this chart, which is very compelling. Turns out that the areas we're weak in are the areas that government controls. Whereas the areas we're strong in are areas that the private sector controls. And so at the root of our declining competitiveness, which again, is not about declining business success, it's about declining joint success, is that the political system can't solve these problems. Yeah. Well, and that seems to be the, the core of the argument is that we've lost the ability to, to solve problems. Uh, and we're, or we'll say we're in danger of that if we wanted to be slightly more optimistic. So- Can I tell you a story? Can I tell you a story once? So I, when I'm on planes, I talk to everybody about politics. You're that person, cool. are you? <laughs> I am that person. 
And, and it usually goes really well because I'm not going to talk any partisan politics and we're going to talk solutions. But nonetheless, I was, I was having this conversation with the gentleman once and he said, I go through my long thing, right? You can see I give long answers. I'm talking, talking, talking. And he goes, you know what? Here's what I would say. We used to be able to solve problems and now we can't. I'm like, oh, okay, well, I wrote a whole, a whole report and, you know, now I have a whole book and he just says it's straight like that. Now, granted, ours includes how to fix that as well, but um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that is, that is the core. And can I say, oh, can I mention one other thing? Sure. Uh, I mentioned the social progress index and I want to bring this up as well. So America, not only was a place of great economic competitiveness, but we also used then the fruits of that economic success to generate an improving quality of life over time. And what we see now is that relative to, again, our competitors, so other countries, the advanced economies with uh, democracies, we're also falling behind there. There's 36 OECD countries. You know, uh, and we are, and I actually will look at these figures for a moment, out of the 36 countries, the United States is 31st in access to basic drinking water, 35th in the maternal mortality rate, yeah. 33rd in the child mortality rate, and you know, 26th in the discrimination or violence against minorities. And we're seeing the enormous and justified frustration in the country around the things that people live in their daily life. So we've got to fix our politics, fix these problems. Yeah. I, I think I'm attributing this right, but I'm remembering, I think Ronald Reagan's uh, sort of reference to the shining city on the hill, which was American democracy. Mm -hmm. um, and it would be um, troubling to think that that's a position that we no longer occupy. But let's, let's get into the, the sort of the core of the core when you talk about the politics industry, you describe it, you and Michael Porter describe this as a duopoly. And I probably on first pass, uh, folks watching or listening to you might scratch their heads and try to go back to uh, high school economics mm -hmm. and think, what was a duopoly again? And, <laughs> and what were the characteristics that, uh, that I ought to, ought to know about? So take us through that. What is the duopoly and, and what problems does it, it cause in our uh, political process? Okay, so I'll get at the duopoly in a moment, but instead of just defining that, let's talk about how competition in any industry works. So let's just think about ourselves as consumers. If we want something, we go into the marketplace and we try this product, and if we like it, we keep buying it, and if we don't like it, it doesn't satisfy our needs, we buy a different product. And there are, in most cases, many companies competing for our business. And it is that cycle of those companies competing against each other to get our business, to make us happy, that creates the improvement in their products over time, the improvement in features or cost, et cetera. So healthy competition can be, is win-win. The companies do well, they grow, those that meet the customer's needs, the customers are happy. Uh, things improve over time. In, and, the core, and the key to that is that the customer has choice and that companies can't keep getting business if they don't do what's needed, what the customer needs. In the duopoly that is our political system, we essentially only have two companies. One red and, and one blue. <laughs> one, one Republican, one Democrat. Yeah, and and it's not um, that having two is a problem because it's two. It's having two that are guaranteed to continue being the only two, even when nobody's happy. Yeah. So we're not automatically saying more would be better. What we're saying is the threat of losing your spot as one of the two if you don't solve problems for the voters needs to exist in the industry. And if it doesn't, then the one thing the two members of this duopoly won't need to do is deliver results for the voters. 
they can focus on doing other things like growing their own power or they can focus on special interests or, or their donors or just party primary voters. How do we change the system so the metric of being successful for these parties is actually the same as the metric of having the country be successful? Yeah. I mean, it's so basic. Yeah. And, and what I like to explain to people is then the problem is that our duopoly is protected by what we say in business, you know, huge barriers to entry. So there's, there's a way the system is set up that keeps out new competitors, no matter how dissatisfied the customers are. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, uh, I don't know if you use this term, but it, it comes to my mind that in a duopoly, let's just say you're, that one characteristic is that it can lead to collusion, uh, which is to say, let's, 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 let's come up with the rules by which we both operate, that whether one team wins or the other team wins, we're both pretty much okay. So is, is that a fair characterization? And, and what are the rules that we're talking about? What are the yeah, rules Dave, that this duopoly operates on? David, thank you. I, I like to say that politics isn't broken, it's fixed. <laughs> Great line. Yeah, uh, which I didn't invent. I actually, a wonderful uh, woman named Sarah Bonk out in California told me about it. I think it might be a John Stewart joke. I'm not sure. Okay. But anyway, I've, I've appropriated it now. Politics isn't broken, it's fixed. Uh, because it turns out that the parties work very well together in one particular way. And that is to behind the scenes, rig the rules of the game to protect themselves jointly from new competition. So they actually want this competition between the two of them. They just don't want to share it, you know, with a third. And I'm going to give you an example of the kind of rule that they work together to create. So fundraising rules, for example, the parties work together and the most recent limits allow any donor to give $855,000 a year to the Democrats and to the Republicans. So, you know, you and I, well, we can't, but I mean, or maybe you can, but you know, you can give this $1.6 million. And at the same time, if one of us wanted to support an independent candidate who doesn't have all this party infrastructure, then we're limited to giving $5,600 over any two year period. So that's a 313 times difference. And you know, the, everybody watching this will know if you can't start up your business, you know, if you can't get any money to start up your business or a loan to continue your business, you're sort of out of business before you begin. And that's a bit the anti-competitive nature of politics. Yeah, give us some other examples of the rules of the game because I think it's important to understand that framework in that context. I like to say the rules of the game in any industry and in any game, you know, board games, sports games and serious games like politics affect the way the game is played and affect the outcomes of that game. And so after analyzing this industry and saying there are huge barriers to entry that keep healthy competition from delivering what competition does, which is improvements in results, what are the rules of the game that create those barriers? So I just gave you one example, which was a fundraising, but it's interesting because it, it turns out that the rules of the game that are the most powerful are not ones that were originally created by the political industrial complex to protect itself, but they're structural rules around which they've now optimized. And those are two things. One, we have party primaries and party primaries effectively push both sides further to, well, one side further to the right, one side further to the left. So very far apart from each other. And because the election is decided in the primary, this is the directive that these uh, Congress people go to Washington DC with. And oftentimes we're sort of aware that the primary does that, push people apart. But what we understand less is that 
The real problem is how it affects what they, is not how it affects who gets elected, it's how it affects what they are capable of doing when they get to Washington, D.C., which is now when someone, an elected official, wants to sign a bipartisan compromise bill on immigration or health care or debt and deficit, um, they, they should ask themselves, obviously, is this a good idea? Is this the right policy? Is this what my constituents want? The majority of my constituents. But they don't ask themselves any of that question, yeah. any of those questions, because what they really have to ask first is, will I get reelected yeah. if I vote for this? Which means, will I get through my party primary if I vote for this? Yeah. And if the answer to that is no, and on all the big issues, it's no, because remember, one is here and one is here. So the same bipartisan bill is, you know, I'm going to vote no if I'm a Democrat and I'm going to vote no if I'm a Republican. We, we have made this rule in a way that we can't ever get results. And then the second thing of the rules of the game is we have plurality voting. Now, none of us think about this. At least I never did. So maybe I do. You, you did. You <laughs> always knew this. Okay. So. Uh, so let me just explain uh, for the people who are more like me who didn't fully uh, comprehend this. So plurality voting means that whoever gets the most votes wins. Now that seems super rational, but it turns out that requiring only a plurality, which is to say the winner has the most votes, but not necessarily over 50%, is a real problem because it creates what's called the spoiler effect. And how I would describe this is with an example that in 2016, our last presidential election, if you were on the right and you wanted to vote for Gary Johnson, the libertarian, you were essentially you know, given the message, you can't vote for him because if you do, you'll take votes away from Trump and you'll give the election to Hillary Clinton and you'll spoil the election for Trump. And on the other side, you're not supposed to vote for Jill Stein, you know, the Green Party candidate on the left, because you'll spoil the election for Hillary. You'll waste your vote, some folks you'll, say. You'll waste your vote and you're spoiled, right? The, the, it does both, the spoiler and wasted vote argument. And now what's interesting is, okay, Jill Stein and Gary Johnson ran. Most of the time, the spoiler problem actually keeps the competition from ever entering the race because they know that they're only going to be a spoiler. And if someone does try to enter the race, then they're hounded out of the race by the duopoly, whatever side of the duopoly they're closest to. So until we get rid of the spoiler problem, we won't see some political entrepreneur, an entrepreneurial candidate saying, oh, you know, this, everybody has, you know, Congress has a 70% approval rating or maybe a I mean, a 70% disapproval rating up to 90% in the last number of years. I'm going to run and offer something new. Yeah. We won't get that. Yeah. Unless See, we don't have a spoiler. The, the combination of the partisan primaries and the spoiler effect means that the incentives we create for people who get elected is that they only have to pay attention to a very small number of people in order to... So... Thus, the, the gridlock and dysfunction and lack of problem solving. And Right. And they only have to pay a very, they only have to pay attention to a very small number of people. And because of the party primary, those numbers of people are a whole bunch over here. That's right. Well, a tiny bunch over here and a tiny bunch over here. So yeah. effectively, about 10% of the electorate is dictating the behavior in Washington, D.C., which is not a recipe for solving yeah. problems. I have to say, you know, you mentioned plurality voting. Uh, you know, every time we've just had a primary here in Pennsylvania and we had a statewide race uh, for Auditor General with seven candidates. And every time I see, and we have plurality voting, and every time I see something like that, I say to myself, we're going to end up electing someone and maybe, you know, onto the general who might have only won the primary with 22% of the vote. So, you know, I, I would like to think, and I, I know you share this, that just doesn't feel, it almost doesn't feel American. <laughs> what happened to majority rule, you know? Right. Uh, yeah, and we don't, and again, we don't even think of that. And what I want to say to your viewers is it's, 
even less, it's, it's not right. It doesn't seem democratic to elect someone with 22% of the vote. But the real problem is not that they got elected with that, but that then when they're making the policy and they're looking towards their next reelection, the only people they're thinking of is, this, is that percentage that they'll need next time, which yep. again, could be just tiny number. So we're, we, one of the things about, about our book and about this whole approach is that I always differentiate it. We're not trying to change who gets elected. Yeah. We're trying to change what they're free to do, what they're incented to do. Actually, we have talented and dedicated politicians. Many of them would still get elected under this new system and then they'll do different things. So I am agnostic about whether we have Republicans, Democrats, independents, you know, yeah. new party people. I just want whoever is elected to be incented to solve problems, and then I will be happy. Well, I think you described yourself in the book as a politically homeless, uh, centrist, uh, independent, or Democrat. Yes. yes. Politically homeless is the key. But but let's we've 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 talked a little bit about the the symptoms um, and the causes. Um, so let's let's go ahead to the cure because you uh, after I think a fair amount of sorting and sifting because I. I saw you speak a few years ago when you were entertaining some other uh, solutions. You settled on two things that uh, in combination you think could really make a difference. So we'll talk about your solution set as it were. Yeah, thanks David. I have taken very much to heart uh, this aphorism strategies about choosing what not to do. And which is something that my co-author Michael Porter said originally, and I always sort of bring it back when we're discussing this. So we need to do as a country, we need to make changes that are powerful, which is to say they'll affect the ability of Washington DC to solve the problems. And we also need to choose to focus on things that are achievable, which is to say, it can't just be a theoretical idea that if it could ever happen would make a difference. That would be something we can actually do and we can do. So our solution is called final five voting. And when, and I'll give you the details in a moment, but when implemented, it will change how we vote to change the incentives that our elected officials respond to and create healthy competition focused on making the voters happy. And, and when I say happy, I mean satisfied with where we're going as a country. And meaning final five voting will dis deliver results, innovation, and accountability. I, I like to now call it free market politics. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's got a nice ring to it. Yeah, the best of what the free markets deliver. Mm -hmm. So healthy free markets is delivers this progress. And it also is a way, healthy competition is a way of sort of figuring out how are you gonna to mix together the diverse viewpoints, right? Like some people want this feature, some people want this feature. Well, what's the reasonable feature set at the reasonable price that we should deliver? Okay, so that's what Final Five Voting is gonna do. And, it, and final, in order to do that, we have to address the eye of the needle that is the partisan primary through which no problem solving politician can pass. And yeah. we have to address plurality voting, which is this biggest barrier to entry. So with final five voting, you pass it, let's say as one law and it says, now we won't have party primaries. We'll just have one primary, single ballot, all the candidates, regardless of party affiliation, independents, greens, libertarians, Republicans, Democrats run on the same ballot. You vote, and when the votes are counted, the top five finishers will advance to the general election. Now we have the period between the primary and the general. We have a robust, dynamic competition of ideas and candidates from five different viewpoints. You know, and maybe people that don't fit neatly a, along this binary, you know, ideological spectrum that we are used to. And then, so so we have this benefit of this fabulous debate because we don't know who's going to win. Wouldn't that be interesting? You don't know after the primary who's going to win. 
And then on election day in November, when the voters go to the polls, they get to rank their choices. So this is worse, and it's something called ranked choice voting. Now, let me say, this is super intuitive. We constantly automatically have preferences. Chocolate ice cream is my favorite, but if they didn't have that, I would wanna have strawberry and then I'd be with vanilla. But boy, oh boy, do I hate that pink, green, whatever those bright color, you know, blue artificial flavoring things are, something, right? You know how you like them. So with the five candidates, you start with your absolute favorite all the way down to please over my dead body, you know, do I want that person to become this, you know, uh, senator, for example. So you rank your choices, one, two, three, four, five. It's on a grid, quite simple to do. And then when the polls close, you, the, the votes are counted, the first place votes are counted. If there's a majority winner, so one of the five gets over 50%, well, the election's over, that person wins. But if no one has over 50%, what if the vote is kind of split evenly between the five? We don't take the person who's ahead by 1%, no. You drop off the last place finisher. And then you have four candidates left and voters who had selected the candidate who's now out of the race have their vote reallocated to one of the, their next choice that's still in the race. Essentially, it's a series of runoffs, but without having to keep coming back for another election because you can cast all your votes at once. Right. It's like right. when you tell someone, oh, you're gonna go pick that up at the store. You're gonna pick up that ice cream. Yeah, get me the chocolate. But if they don't have chocolate, if they're out of chocolate, get me the strawberry. And if they're out of both of those, then get me the vanilla. Right, right. And so that's how we do it. And what that does is you keep rerunning the totals until you elect the candidate who has a true majority, meaning they're now need to be concerned about the broadest constituency in their district. And, and it also makes the general election more important than the primary, which is how it should be. But the most important thing again, because remember, we're, we're not trying to change who gets elected, we're trying to change what they do, is that now when they're in Washington, DC, they could be still a Democrat and a Republican, but they can now evaluate their choice to solve one of these complicated policy issues with a bipartisan consensus solution. They can now say to themselves, gosh, under the old system, I never would have made it back through my partisan primary if I voted for this. Yeah. But under the new one, I'll be in the top five. And I think that with first and second place votes, I can get a win. So you make solving problems compatible with getting reelected yeah. instead of the other way around. Yeah, it's an elegant uh, two-part play. And, and some folks might say, maybe if you're not tuned into this, well, Catherine, that seems all well and good, but never gonna happen in real life. And I would say, cause I, track this stuff that there is not a top five, a state uh, that uses top five, but there are states that use top two, notably California. And there are a growing number of states and localities, most recently New York City, I think last last fall was it? It that, was. That approved ranked choice voting. Um, and I think it's on the ballot in Massachusetts this fall uh, and has- Correct, been in November. Maine as well. So. You are pushing the envelope uh, in terms of, you know, top five rather than top two. But these are not uh, these are not unknowns in the in the political landscape. So that might suggest that there's some traction here. Let, let's talk. Oh, go ahead. Oh, yeah. There certainly is traction. It's not just theory. We can make these changes, and we don't need. I mean, what's amazing about it is that we don't need a constitutional amendment to do this. Yeah. We don't need the whole country to agree. We don't even need politicians to agree in half the states. In half the states, we can just put a measure on the ballot and the people can vote if they want to change to final five voting. Yeah. So the, the ability to get this done, is it's not easy. It's just, it, it, there really is a path versus if I said to you, Oh, David, 
I know exactly what we need to do and it's going to take a constitutional amendment. Well, you should just shut me off. <laughs> That's right. You know, because Thanks for playing. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. And you uh, dedicate the better part of a chapter in the book to a reflection on the progressive era, uh, which my organization is a child of the progressive era. We were founded mm -hmm. in 1904. Uh, so every hundred years, maybe uh, there's kind of an upwelling of these kinds of ideas. But I guess the maybe the observation or the, the yearning suggests or that you express in the book is that maybe maybe we're in the midst of another progressive era. And uh, by the way, I like, you know, the word progressive has been redefined. <laughs> I saw uh, John Hickenlooper, Governor John Hickenlooper speak a couple years ago, and he said, I'm a progressive in the old fashioned sense of the word, which is that every day we're making progress to goals that we care about. So that's how I define progressive and I'm, I'm sure you too. But what, what, what in, in reflecting on the progressive area, do you really think we're in the midst of a time where these, what seem like radical ideas to some could actually take root? Is there political energy? We're gonna be all totally exhausted after this presidential race. But what gives you hope that there's, um, there's energy? You know, change management always, like the study of change management organizations always teaches you that you need a burning platform usually yeah. to get people to change because inherently humans don't like change so much. So it is ever so, unfortunate is isn't a big enough word. It is really, there's a lot of tragic things going on in the country and that we've gotten to this point of divisiveness um, and that so many problems have gone unsolved for so many decades that the frustration has legitimately built to a level of outrage that, you know, is just, again, I, I use the word tragic. And so because of that, I think that other people may not think about their stages of grief the way I now classify mine, but they may be so dissatisfied now with the existing system, so beyond frustrated that they're searching about and enough of them will come to know that we have to change this system. And it doesn't take every American, every single American to know that we need to change plurality voting. It takes the number of people it takes to get these campaigns going in each of 50 states and, and you know, put some resources into the campaigns to win them. So I think that, I think the, the reason it's gonna work is because the need has reached a level that no one can ignore. And because the solution is actually, you know, not 50 things. Now, don't get me wrong. This final five voting is not the only thing that we should do. It's not the only valuable thing to work on. And later we should do other things, et cetera. But there is a pain point that can be identified, which is this lack of healthy competition that we can go after it. I mean, I think you can get critical massive attention on that issue. And then again, because we talked about achievability, it's achievable, which is to say, even if the need is so great, which it is, if what we had to do required a constitutional amendment, I, that would be, I would still say we should try. I mean, we should never give up on our Republic, but that would be a harder lift. And so this combination of great need and actual feasibility of something powerful yeah. That's pretty attractive. Yeah. Well, you paint, I think, an intriguing picture that maybe this is that sweet spot, as you said, of something that is worth doing that also seems doable. And, and, yeah. and you point out that um, the beauty and sometimes the frustration of the way this whole democracy thing was constructed is these rules are set at the state level. So states can change and you can have one uh, rolling uh, into another and, and build some critical mass. So it doesn't, we, we, we can't rely on the dysfunctional Congress to change the rules to make for a less, more functional Congress. But so it's- yeah, here's, here's an interesting point too. So, you know, 
as you say, all the states can make these rules individually. So I talked about the referendum states where the citizens can gather signatures, put on the ballot, and then they have to get some money to run the campaign to educate people on what they're voting on. And then, you know, if more people vote yes than no, they'll have accomplished this. But in the other states where we have to have the legislature pass a bill and the governor sign it, which is about half the states. That's Pennsylvania. Yeah, right. And Wisconsin, where I live. Yeah. So in that case, I think there's a visceral reaction at first. Oh, well, the politicians are never going to do that because they're not going to change their own rules. But here again is where we have a focus that makes it achievable. We propose and really advocate for final five voting for Congress. Do I think it would be great in states? Sure, I think it would be great. However, Congress is where this enormous national divisiveness and partisanship is really uh, sort of drama centered and where we need to uh, deliver these solutions from first. So if we're asking the state legislator to change this, we actually can have agreement across the political spectrum that Washington is broken. Yeah. It's a, you can't it, get agreement in a state that a state capital is broken because yeah. whichever party is controlling it, if you're that party, you reasonably like what your state capital is doing, except in a few terribly dysfunctional states. Yeah. So you can get agreement from the grassroots, the grass middles, the grass tops, Democrats, Republicans, independents, and you can get agreement from politicians and from governors that Washington is broken. So I believe that legislation is feasible. And here's something you probably have uh, a relationship with your governor. I think that there is a opportunity for a governor in this. And I, I want to sell it to some governor that's watching here, which is to say, <laughs> here's an opportunity to lead. Yeah in the biggest change that's gonna happen in this 100 year time frame, like to be the Teddy Roosevelt yeah. that we're still talking about 100 years from now. And the reason it's that opportunity is because it's the right thing that needs doing, but also because I think it's a political opportunity. I believe there's gonna be a governor who's gonna realize that uh, she or he would like to be the next person, uh, would like to be on that next presidential debate stage, not this year, but the next one saying, you know, all these people talking about draining the swamp, yeah. I, I'm the only one who actually did something. Yeah. We in my state did this. So, and, and, and also if a governor and a legislature decided to work together to do that, you, you don't even have to spend the money on the, you know, ballot initiative campaign. Oh yeah. 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 If you can get it done, it's, it's a less expensive and less time consuming proposition. So yeah. Do you uh, want, can you go call your governor when we're done here? <laughs> Yeah, uh, the but long, you know, yeah. someone's going to do it. No, I I totally agree with you, and I think you're absolutely right that uh, sort of um, illuminating the political capital that could come with this kind of a change is, uh, you know, could be very attractive to the right governor in the right place. Yeah, and so I'm saying to, when I get on a chance to be on shows like yours, I I sort of have two calls to action. One is, please buy the book so that you can read it and be engaged. And also because it has follow-up information about how to contact my organization so we can connect you with the campaigns. I mean, it's very, very, very actionable. Yeah. But the second thing is I make this like individual appeal to whoever might be out there who can get a meeting with their governor because I would love to come, join you by Zoom, whatever, to just make this case. Yeah. Um, because yeah. I, I know there's someone out there who, will have the courage and leadership and foresight to lead the way. Yeah. Well, it's a it's a powerful proposition. And I I think you and, and Michael Porter did a masterful job of uh, framing the problem and the challenge and the opportunity. I'll give the book one more plug, The Politics Industry, How Political Innovation Can Break, Partisan Gridlock and Save Our Democracy. Uh, Catherine Gale, thanks so much for being with us. Book comes out June 23rd. And Correct. Do you, have, do you have any favorite booksellers to recommend? Is there a uh, one in your home base of Wisconsin that uh, needs some business? Or uh, oh, we have you know so many fabulous stores. I wouldn't want a single one particular one out. I would actually say to people, please support your own local bookstore. 
There you go. You know, because especially in this time, we need to be supporting our local bookstores. If you call them now, they'll put it on pre-order for you. If you do still want to buy online, many organizations sell this book. And if you go to our website, which is um, gaelporter.org, so G-E-H-L-P-O-R-T.org, we have links to all the places you can buy it. And I should tell you, David, Michael and I have donated all the proceeds of the book to this organization I founded, Institute for Political Innovation, so that we can turn the proceeds back into furthering the work. Wonderful. Yeah. Good for you. Well, thanks so much for joining us and, and best of luck. And we look forward to seeing you on the trail. Oh, thank you, David. It's just wonderful to see you again. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.